everybody to the next edition of our fly fishing Stillwater series. This one here is called Brent's Top 10 for very good reason. Brent Schlenker is a Ikakoma professional tire. He's a commercial tire. He's developed some patterns. He's taken some patterns and modified them. And in this DVD, he's going to be, this was mainly about fly tying. Let's get this guy in here. He's going to tell you how to tie 10 of his favorite patterns that he uses on his lakes up in the Cypress Hills, which is where we're getting to film this. The nice thing for me is we get to film down here at the Hog Lake. <laughs> oh, look at that fish. Isn't that a beauty? Wow. The girth, the size, back in the water. Wow. Well, unfortunately, as the fish swims away, my fishing is done because now i got to run the camera for the rest of the video. But I know you're really going to enjoy it. It's Brent's top 10, 10 great lake patterns. And now, let's get on with the DVD. Thanks for the introduction, Grant. And one question I want to ask Brent before we start. You know, Brent's kind of spoiled. He gets to fish these trophy lakes over in the Cypress Hills. But why do you like lake fishing other than catching hogs? Well, lake fishing is... Uh, a very long season, we're not susceptible to runoff like we are in rivers and so forth, and it does open up a lot more water for us to fish as well. I enjoy fishing rivers, but when you can fish lakes, and, and like you say, uh, some lakes do hold a lot larger fish too, they can, they can grow uh, very quickly. Yeah, and you also mentioned the mystique or the puzzle behind still water fishing. What is that still water puzzle? Yeah, very good question. First thing I do when I get to any lake is I look for the structure. Every lake has its own characteristics for structure, may it be channels or shoals or depths or whatever the case may be. So understand what the bottom of the lake looks like. A lot of people look at a lake surface. Yes. I try to look below. I want to visualize what the lake bottom looks like. Now we know trout really want three things. They want food, shelter, and temperature. So if we can understand our structure, then we can start putting those pieces together. And easy to get, yeah, easy to get the, the temperature, use a the thermometer. We can use a the thermometer, but if it's a nice hot day, fish will be in the depth. So we want to know by understanding the structure, now we can do that with maybe depth finders, but we can also do it just by driving in and, and looking and imagining the water body. So if you get a steep cliff, of course, that's going to protrude in the water and be a drop off. Or if you get a, a nice gradual slope on the shore, well, there will be a shoal area there that the fish will be cruising and so forth. So. You kind of want to look below the surface. Put the puzzle together. That's where the puzzle starts. From your experience in still water fishing, how does somebody like me or any other rookie become very effective in a still water fishery? Well, Don, you're not a rookie, so we won't <laughs> go into that. But uh, the keys to become a successful lake angler, I believe, most of the time fish are opportunists. Only about 10% of the time they're really specific, and we have to match the hatches per okay. se. A lot of times the fish are opportunists, uh, so if we can move the fly and the movement, imitate the movement of that food item, we're usually in the game. So uh, movement is really the key, I believe, in, in becoming a successful lake angler. And what about colors? you think colors are important? Yes, colors can be quite important. What I do usually there is, is the first thing I'll do is match the vegetation color oh. for the lake bottom. If it's a muddy bottom lake, I'll use more of brownish colored patterns. Now if there's dark olive uh, weed cover, I'll do that when I'm rigging up or whatever. I'll check for weed color and try to try to go there with colors for starters. But basically I think movement is really the most important key. If it looks like food, if it's moved in a manner that resembles food, fish will eat it. I think we should head to the first fly. I know you've got one of your favorites. Is it Denny Rickard pattern? Is it, uh, what what do you call it? Well, Denny Sealbugger, my Denny friend Denny Sealbugger. Rickards from uh, Fort Klamath, Oregon. Yeah. He has uh, come up with this pattern years ago. Uh, I, I seen the fly in a magazine, a fly fisherman, and I tied six of those flies up before I went to a public lake one morning and uh, caught the biggest fish I ever uh, caught out of that lake in my second cast. And, and I had a terrific day, and, and it just kept producing for me ever since. Well, let's go to the bench and actually show everybody how we tie up Denny Sealbugger. Okay. Well, we've come to the bench, and Brent will be doing all the time. The first fly we're going to tie is Denny Sealbugger. Make sure you have these materials ready before you tie the fly. For the hook, we're going to use a size 8 to 10 4X streamer. We'll tie with 6 aught black thread. For the tail, we'll use some burnt orange marabou with pearl flashaboo highlights, some olive seal fur for the body. For the rib, we'll use some copper wire, some burnt orange saddle hackle for the hackle, and some .02 lead for the weight. 
Well, folks, the first fly we're going to tie today is Denny Sealbugger. A friend of mine, Denny Records from uh, Oregon, came up with this fly a number of years ago. That's how I really run across him. It's a very effective fly. We're going to use a 4X long streamer hook, small tool lead, and we'll just weight the front. Well, 20 turns of lead on the front. With the tail, I'll use marabou, of course, a very popular fly tying material. And there's so many different types of marabou quills out there. Now, I'm, I selected a blood quill, which you can see nice long fibers, very strong, it's very breathable. I use that on all my lake flies. And some of the other plumage, the real bushy marabou, and that I'll use more on my river patterns so they pulsate in a stream or a river. Now, the lake flies, I want them long and I want them to undulate. So I get my tail is shank length at least. Could be even a little longer, but shank length is good. Way to measure, always use your hook shank to measure your proportions. Very fine long tail there, so it's going to breathe and undulate in the water quite easily. I'll take a little pearl crystal flash, flash of boo I should say, not crystal flash doesn't breathe in the water, it's very, very stiff and so we want some soft materials on here. It's a little bit of flash of boo, it breathes in the water quite naturally. We're going to use some copper wire for the ribbing. I can tie this in at the rear of the hook, the bend. Then I'll select this uh, burnt orange hackle. We get this all custom dyed. These are nice saddle hackles. Jay Fair does a lot of dyeing for Denny down on the state side, and I have a company up in Canada that dyes it for us now, and it's do a really good job. The burnt orange is a very popular color, and uh, just a custom dye lot that we get done. We'll tie that good side up. Our little tip off there. No, I throw a half hitch on my Norvice, which is a spinning vise. This is actually quite nice. It works like a spinning wheel. Now we're going to just trap a little bit in here and watch this Norvice. It'll spin as thick or as thin as I want. The body is quite thin. We don't want to get too too bushy. We want that iridescent quality coming through. We just dub it forward. Now to make a fly a little more durable, I'll put the wire over top of the hackle after it's tied in, but Denny was really uh, critical on this. He wants the ribbing on first, and we'll tie it just the way Denny does it. I do lots of flies for him, and they are an awesome fly. This is one of my go-to flies. It's all burnt orange and great color. Straight olive is an awesome color, kind of a sculpin type olive. Um, black is, is great and also black and burgundy is another popular color. And then I've also, I use uh, a black and purple mix with ice, a little ice stub in it. So you tweak them up a little bit. But now the hackle, you're going to think it's not really a woolly bugger. It's got four individual turns of hackle. I'm going to take one at the back, then I'm going to come forward, sweep forward, sweep forward. Now when I come at the front, I can take about three turns. It looks like one turn. Just makes it a little bit thicker. If I took one wrap there, it would be a little on the thin side. So I want to make sure I have a little extra hackle on the front of the fly. But as you see when we, we get this hackle turned back, how it's got four individual segments. A lot of times with, when you take an olive pattern, you'll use olive thread. What we do is we use black thread on all the flies that we have weighted. So if you ever, that's a little tip for you, when you're looking through your fly boxes and you're wondering what flies are weighted, you can, you can check that out just with thread color. Some people will use red or what have you, but we just like to use black. That's our standard color. Now brush, brush a little bit of that seal fur out so it's sticking out. And you also have the four turns of burnt orange hackle in there, and that is a real, very good fly. Um, when you see a fly up in the, in, the, in the light, that's where I like to look at a lot of flies in the light. Uh, you'll see the iridescence quality of that. So there you go folks, that's Denny Sealbugger and one of my best lake flies that I've fished. And uh, I think me and Don will head out the water there and give it a try. Well, I get to be the net guy. I got the net ready and, and now I want everybody to see how Brent fishes these patterns. He's got the great patterns, got a great technique to fish it. And why don't you go through the first setup that you're going to use actually for that, that fly we tied. You know, for Denny Sealbugger and a lot of my lake angling, I'll use a clear camo intermediate line. 
I use a clear camo on what I call like stained waters. These aren't real pristine lakes like a lot of your British Columbia lakes are. So okay. the clear camo is an awful good choice and, and it uh, sinks about one and a quarter inches per second on. So uh, I'm just going to get a nice long cast out there. And then we're going to fish it very slow pulls, long slow pulls and a pause. So I'm just going to usually, it's a little early in the year, so I'm going to retrieve it fairly, fairly slow. Give it a pause, let it dip. But a one one foot pull or so, Don, and okay. that's usually what works the best for me. fly number one. I hope everybody enjoyed the fishing and the fly tie. Now we're off to number two and that's going to be Brent's blood leech. Make sure you have these materials ready before you tie this pattern. For the hook we're going to use a size 8 or 10 4x long streamer. We'll tie with 6 aught black thread. For the tail we'll use some burgundy marabou with red floral fiber highlights. For the body we'll use red and black angora goat with a red wire dubbing brush. For the bead we'll use a red glass bead and some .02 lead for the weight. Well folks, the next fly we're going to tie is uh, what I call Brent's Blood Leech. Uh, we use a 4X long streamer hook for that as Don has mentioned on our materials list. And then I'll put a red glass bead over the fly here. And uh, let's go to our lead. We'll put some lead on the front. Of course always your leech patterns must be leaded on the front so it gives your undulation. When you pause or retrieve, your fly will dip and when you pull, it'll raise with the undulation of a leech. Now I'll just take my black thread, just build a little bit of a uh, tying base. It's a lot, a lot nicer to tie with a little thread tying base on your hooks, dress them so your materials don't slip around on them quite as easy. It makes a much more durable fly. Now with the, uh, this pattern as well, we use a long burnt, or burgundy uh, blood quill again. I'll sort through my marabou. I'm very careful with that. If I see any marabou that's really thick, I'll give you an example here. You'll see the, th the thick stems, it's very brittle and it breaks. So you'll go through all the trouble of tying or fishing this fly and, and it'll, the, the marabou is much too brittle. So I want the long, nice, fine blood quill. And go to shank length again. Gives this fly a lot of movement. Now you can put a little highlight in the tail if you want. Either use none, or if you do, I've, all I've chosen here is some fluorofiber, which is very, very fine flash. If you can find that at your fly shops, great. If not, don't use, don't use crystal flash. It's very, it inhibits the movement of the marabou. Axle flash may be okay or something like that. Something very soft. So that's our tail. Also what I've done in the, recently, we, marabou is an awesome fly tying material as we all know. Here's some arctic fox. The guard hairs of an arctic fox will swim and breathe. Just trim a little out here to show you. We'll take the, the guard hairs off the bottom. A little hide in there. We'll just strip that out. Now if you want a really, really durable substitute for marabou, Try this out folks, that is arctic fox, it's a guard here from an arctic fox and it swims like nothing else in the water, it swims really freely and it's durable, it's bulletproof, you cannot pull that apart, it'll never, never break. So if I wanted, my flies now, I started using arctic fox in a lot of different patterns and uh, makes it a very, very durable fly. Now you're going to see in the body of this fly, we're going to use a red wire here. I'm just going to make a dubbing brush. And this body in this fly is also super durable. What we're going to do now is bring in a dubbing table. A little adjustable table that has a little bit of felt on the top just so my material don't slip and slide on me. The African goat or Angora goat is blended. I just do that in a drink blender. Make sure you get your own. You don't want to be 
borrowing the milkshake mixer at home, you can buy a little inexpensive blender. And I usually suggest this very sparsely. I just lay the materials on top of the dubbing table. Then the wire goes, my thread's on, my material's laid across here. Now I bring the wire over the top, just grab my materials in between, take my dubbing table out, and proceed to start turning. Now this, this just spins tighter, tighter, and tighter. If I feel any, there's a little bit of clumping there, I'll pull that out. But I think the secret of this fly, you can buy blended um, leech yarns, if you will, but I find it lays back in the shank. I think the fibers being coming off the wire brush very perpendicular here creates a iridescence in the water. Traps a little air in there too, and it's not a solid color, and we know that really works. So I just spin it forward. As you see, with quite a bit of wire in there, it's all trapped in the wire, so that body is super tough. This fly, if you don't break it off, you can fish it all day. Use sharp hooks again. Make sure these big fish, if you're fishing large fish, they have hard mouths. I can take a little dubbing picker with a little wire brush or pick that out. Just get it to flow back. But the fly does have some iridescence, some color to it, and it's super durable. <laughs>
I'm going to dub the back part of this fly just a little bit thicker. We're going to go about halfway and then we'll tie on our legs. So we'll just grab our goose bites here and take a couple off. I'm going to lay the curved side out and the tip will be to the end of the bend and I'll tie one on each side. We'll wrap it down very firmly. So I don't like to dub the whole body because the legs will pull out. I'll lay one on this side to me. Then I'll trim the butts of the uh, goose pilots off here. Throw another half hitch on there and dub the front part of the fly, the front part of the body. And that won't be quite as thick as the rear. I want to get a little bit of a shape to it. And we'll go forward. See that rabbit is really uh, sticking out, really nice buggy tie there. Buggy nymphs. Now we'll pull our underbody forward with our pearl crystal flash. I'm going to get a few turns here to secure it down. Now I won't cut that off at this point because it could pull out. So what I do is pull back on my crystal flash back over itself and tie back over itself once more. So that will be a lot more secure. So all we do now is we pull our thin skin, this is mottled oak, it's got a natural color, it looks very much like a natural, over the top. And that is the shiny side, is what you're going to see now of that thin skin. And whip finish that off. I used to like, I like to use a whip finish tool. It, I put a little more pressure on my ties there and it uh, seems to hold a little better. And I also head cement all my flies. Just any time I can make it a little more durable, I'd, I'd rather spend a little more time in the vise or in my tying table than out on the lake when I want to fish. Let's go out in the water and check it out. nice pattern that we just showed you to tie is that water boatman, France boatman, and the nice time of the year, when do you prefer to fish it? Well, early spring and late fall, it's uh, very much a, a pattern that you'd want to fish, especially in the fall when you get the mating flight of the water boatman when they get airborne and they start returning back to the lake. And it's like water droplets hitting the water. Yeah, they went around and everything's like just like it's raining water. Boatman. Right. It might not be a cloud in the sky. You can see a little, uh, like, like, like you say, a small little... Uh, Rainstorm or whatever. Do you have a certain tricks now that let's let's show everybody how you actually retrieve the boatman? Well, usually with the boatman, seems it's a vertical and uh, they go up to the water and grab their air bubbles and, and descent again straight down. So I'll fish it with a sink tip line okay. to get my pattern to, to to go straight down vertically and and uh, that seems to work the best. I just give it two little hand twists and then a pause. And then two little hand twists and then a pause. So you want it to do this as it's starting down? Yeah. And they usually, most of the time, they hit it on the pause. What we want to do is actually go take it to the next fly. You know what? You want to go up and tie Dye's Danzel. Now, why did you call it Dye's Danzel? Well, it's a little, uh, little fly I just named after her because when the damsel hatch starts happening in June, yeah. uh, my wife Diane's really proficient with a, a damsel pattern. and. Uh, Come up with a little fly that uh, a lot of damsel patterns have kind of a long body and a very short tail. Okay. Not a lot of movement. So what I've done is kind of with Denny Rickard's kind of philosophy of a short body and long tail. It's a very simple fly to tie, and it's got a lot of movement and it's very effective and really easy to tie. And that's to me is a perfect bug. Excellent. Well, you know what? Let's go to the bench and tie up ties down. Okay, Don. There's nothing more enjoyable than fishing a damsel hatch, and the next pattern Brent's going to tie you is actually named after his wife, Diane. So the next fly coming up is Dye's Danzel. Make sure you have these materials ready before you tie the fly. For the hook, we're going to use a 2x short nymph, size 12 to 14. We'll use some olive 6 aught thread to tie with, some olive marabou for the tail, some olive marabou for the body. For the rib, we'll use some olive crystal flash, and some bead chain eyes for the eyes. Well, the next fly we're going to tie, folks, is Dye's Damsel. I'm going to do this after my wife Diane because she loves fishing a damsel hatch and has got a really good retrieve that seems to work better than a lot of us guys. She does very well with it. I'm going to take my modeled uh, olive bead chain eyes, or actually you can buy them modeled, and I'm just going to X that on the front. The damsel, of course, very prominent eyes. 
brakes set on the front. We're going to run our thread back to the bend and grab some olive marabou. Now you can use, you got to match the naturals of course. You want to tie this in, in several colors of olives and brown olives. Olive browns are good too. So here again we're going to go into our selector blood quilt. Very important that you have good quality marabou for lake flies. Get a little thin portion off. Now why we use a short shank hook? A lot of patterns have long shank hooks and very short tails. They don't seem to wiggle as much as I like it. So the short shank and a, and a long tail gives it much more movement. So I'm going to lash this on so that we're using a very short shank hook but probably going three times longer than the shank with the tail. Now this is going to become the body, the butt of that tail marabou there. Grab some olive crystal flash, put one strand in there is all, just to give it that little extra sheen that these nymphs have when they're, when they're swimming ashore. I'll get rid of this flash in the back here. Now the body, we're just going to simply wrap the butt of the marabou forward. And when I get just behind the eyes, I'm going to take one turn of thread just to hold it there and grab my pearl crystal flash and just give it some nice ribbing there, simulate some segmentation there, also that translucency that that damsel nymph does have in the water. Now we're just simply going to pull our butts up through the eye of the hook, split it in between and tie it behind the eyes. That's where we tie it off. Trim a little tuft on top there, get our whip finish tool, take a couple turns, not too much, don't want too much thread showing, and just saw the thread off with my scissors. So that's a very simple tie and works quite well. Ties damsel. We'll go with the water and give it a try. showed everybody that real nice dyes damsel pattern, which is a really cool pattern. We want to tell everybody how to approach it when you're fishing damsel. So why don't you explain a little bit about damsel fishing? Yeah, right on. Uh, well, of course we're not in our boat because uh, as damsels, as you know, they'll come to the shore and they'll crawl up in our, on reeds or whatever and weeds right. to, to hatch. So it's really important that you fish damsels either from your pontoon boat or belly boat close to shore and fish towards the shore or I prefer to fish on the beach and, and fish the pattern back to you. So we're going to use just a, a clear intermediate line. I don't want it, I want it to stay fairly uh, uh, neutral. And I'm bringing it up through the, through the zone and then uh, fish it up really, really tight to the bank. Okay, well we've got a real nice shoreline here. What we're going to do, do a little scouting. We've got our polarized glasses on. Fish are starting to cruise, so we'll just have a look and see if we can find some and cast to them. Sure, let's see what we can do, Doc. Yeah, well, we were set up, we saw a couple of fish boil along here, so we're taking a few casts. Let's talk a bit about the retrieve for the damsel. Well, we want to have our rod tips right close to the water there. We're going to fish just a slow, probably a six inch pull here, Don. Going to keep it moving. Do you like to also use a hand twist retrieve at all with the damsel? You can use a faster hand twist like that to get that uh, damsel moving. I, I don't let them stop and rest, so the damsels basically keep moving, don't they? They do. They wiggle, wiggle, always wiggling sideways yeah. and always moving. You know, if we could only figure out how to make a fly go sideways, <laughs> we'd have yeah. it made. No but kidding. I don't know if anybody's really come up with that one yet. But an important point, again, like Brent said, is make sure that rod tip is right near the water. We always stress it. Very important, so you get the good hook set. If the rod tip's too high, you don't feel the fish. Well, the next pattern we're going to tie you is one of my favorites, personally, because we use it up in the interior all the time, and it imitates the big traveling sedge pupas that come off, and it is called... Uh, Brent's Premier. Brent's Premier. It's a great pattern. It is, Don. I've actually got it from Premier Lake. There's another angler over there. I wish I could uh, uh, tell you who he was. He just fell a dragon of a fly. I, I tweaked it up a bit from what he had, but I also fish on some lakes, and I, I think they're taking it for beetle larvae. Oh, so, so a there's of a pattern that nobody's ever fished or, or a, a food form that nobody's even thought of and a very big meal for big trout. We're nice. Gonna see some nice fish coming. Nice. Out. Well, let's take it to the bench and tie up Brent's Premier. <laughs> well, 
Here's Brent's Premier Fly, and it's actually called Brent's Premier. It's a very, very versatile pattern, mainly because it imitates so many different food items. Make sure you have these materials ready before you tie the fly. For the hook, we're going to use a 1x long size 8 nymph, some 6 aught brown thread to tie with, some peacock chenille for the body. For the hackle, we'll use a brown saddle hackle, and for the shell back and tail, we use some moose body hair. The next fly we'll tie here is called Brent's Premier. Now we've fished this fly in just about every zone right from the depth of the lake right to the top water with uh, very slow sink intermediate lines, floating lines to full sink lines at different levels and uh, we, we think they're taking it for caddis um, pupa or also uh, beetle larvae which many people don't fish a beetle pattern in them, and beetle larvae are very much a big food item for trout. The emerald green is really important for the body color. So you can get this peacock green, this is a glow bright chenille, and also one of the nicest things that's happened with fly tying materials for a number of years, with all these synthetics that keep coming out, but they've actually started dyeing peacock curl. Now this is a really nice bright green peacock curl. And that is, uh, we know how great peacock curl is in so many patterns, so I'm going to take a generous uh, bunch of peacock curl here, if you will. Now what I do tie in peacock curl, We've uh, varied off uh, the recipe what Don gave you earlier, but I just want to demonstrate something here in the peacock curl for you because it's such a good material. I tie in a generous uh, amount of that, probably a dozen strands. I tie it in by the tips. Throw in my half hitch here, and when I pull it back, it gets buggier. If you tie it in by the butts, you actually flatten it out as you work ahead. So I'm going to go forward, and now I'm just going to spin it into a peacock curl rope which makes it very, very durable. Gives me that iridescence of peacock curl. It's that emerald green I'm looking for. Now the success of this fly, I think, I believe, I'm not sure, but this is my thoughts on this, is, is the moose body hair. It's very uh, buoyant. This fly would be a neutral buoyant fly, and it uh, won't sink and it won't float. It'll stay in the zone for a very long time. As long as you have the, the fly line to take it and keep it in the zone for a long period of time, this is the fly that'll that'll do it for you. I'm going to pinch it on either side of the hook shank and get a few good solid turns down here. I want it to hold and I'm right behind the eye. The butts I'm going to trim off at an angle so I don't get too big a lump there when I pull it back. Then we'll just go to some brown hackle. The saddle hackle we want something that'll swim a little bit. This is furnace, which the furnace has actually a black stripe down the center of it. Any brown will be fine. Now I'm just going to take the thread and the hackle back together to the bend of the hook. There we go. I'll tie it off at the rear. Pull it off because the thread's actually got it secured down. I'm just going to pull my loose over the top. When I pull it, it'll tighten it right down. See, I've grabbed a little bit of hackle here. I can. Use a bodkin if I had one handy here. I don't. I'm just going to use my scissors to tease that out. We'll finish it off at the back of the fly. Lots of turns, good solid turns. My whip finish, saw it off. That completes the fly, or almost completes the fly. What you want to do, which is really important, on a full back pattern, you'll notice that the hackle is spun on and you'll see it sticking up and out from the side. If you fish a fly like that, it'll spin in the water, and the fish will know it's a fake. What I'll do here is trim down on the sides of the fly about a 45 degree angle. Do that on all your full back slopes. Make sure you don't cut any of the, the shell back. But you see the legs coming off the bottom of the fly here now? It's very much, that fly will fish naturally It'll stay with the point down all the time. It'll swim the way it should. Well, it's a really impressive tie. You know, I really enjoy watching that tie, and it's just the look of it. It just looks like something edible, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a very easy fly to tie, as you can see. Um, that's one thing I really like. Uh, flies that work well and they're easy to tie, that's a big, uh, big part of my designs, but the uh, this fly here, I think it's sparked something on a lot of different fly patterns. I think the moose over the top is a, it makes a neutral buoyant, 
so I can keep it in a very shallow zone for a long, long time. It won't sink or won't float. And the other big key that I've noticed when I fish it is it stays with the hook down, which is really nice. Yeah. It always stays with the back up. It looks natural. Now well, time to go through the retrieve for Brent's Premier. The retrieve, we vary it up a lot. You can go very slow, little two inch pulls, little quick two inch pulls, the longer six inch paws. It just, this fly just keeps working and working in every zone and so many different retrieves that uh, and imagine every lake is going to be a little different too. Yeah, like when I was using it actually for the case cast imitation, I was trying to creep it near the bottom, just trying to crawl it along in the marl, and the fish would come by and scoop it up. So I guess it really depends on the application. For sure. And it's very, very versatile. Fly, That's what it? makes it so nice. It's a versatile pattern. Premier, you know, great pattern. A lot of times you come to a lake and you have to search it out and there's no way you can get around it. You know, you do everything you said. Here's the next pattern we're going to do. It's called the uh, cycle quad. Cycle it's not quad. one of my patterns, but it's one of my favorite searching patterns. As you say, a lot of times we get into trying to imitate different forms, life forms, and this one does imitate several. And I use it for a searching pattern. Excellent. So let's go to the bench, tie up cycle quad. <laughs> Some flies are just great searching patterns, and the next fly Brent's going to tie, which is called the Cycle Quad, is just one of those patterns. Make sure you have these materials ready before you tie the fly. For the hook, we're going to use a 2x long nymph, size 10 to 12. For the thread, we'll use some fire orange 6 aught thread. For the tail, we'll use some golden olive marabou, some brown crystal dub for the body, some copper wire for the ribbing, and a partridge for the hackle. Now folks, what we'll tie is uh, a psycho quad. Here's a pattern that I found in a fly fishing magazine several years ago. It's a, it's a tie that came off of uh, Mark Olander's Pequod, I believe, and uh, another gentleman changed the materials, basically, and uh, I've tied this fly and fished it quite often, and it's, a, it's an effective little bug. So we're going to use some golden olive for the tail. I'm going to tie it about shank length. Tie it in, and I'll take my turn in the back, as we talked about earlier, and that just binds that down right at the tie-in point, cut my butts off the marabou. Simple, simple ties. Great. A little wire ribbing here. We're just going to use that for the segmentation of the body. And the body material is crystal dub. We'll take our crystal dub, and we'll dub that on fairly fine. It's going to have some fibers come out of it, which is good. Get a little buggy appearance. I still want somewhat of a slim profile. I don't want to get too thick. I'm going to take maybe some mayfly nymphs or something like that. The, the lime or the golden olive tail probably could be a damsel. A little ribbing on there for the body. So what I want to do is grab a nice brown partridge hackle here. This soft hackle flies are just great. I ripped a little patch off of there, but just to show you now, I could tie a couple dozen flies with all those little feathers right there. We're going to take the soft fluffy webby hackle off the bottom. Then I'm going to grab just the tip and pull it out of the way. We'll tie it good side facing forward. I'm just going to catch it in. Tie the tip in. Wrap this one backwards. And what we want to do is fold the hackle to make it work. It's got to breathe. Movement means life, life means food. So just watch when I go, I'm making a turn very gently and I'm going to pull it back to fold it. Every turn is going to be ahead of the next one. And that's a folded hackle. And you'll see it stays away, it doesn't lay flat back on the body. I'm going to trim my butt off there. I'm right up on the eye, just so the eye is clean, so I can tie on and form a small head of this fire orange. It's a, it's a little attractor color too. Red's a very, orange is a very visible color for rainbows. 
find that we call the July doldrums, summer doldrums at Rainbows will chase, chase orange. So that little red on the front doesn't hurt this fly at all. It's very nice. But the fly is, has got the folded hackle, so it'll breathe in the water as we retrieve it. And that turns the fish on. It, it really works. So it's, you've got kind of an emerger thing going here. You got a, could be a damsel at times, could be a mayfly nymph, could be a water boatman. It just m might imitate so many different food forms. And, We'll go to the water and fish this fly, and I'm going to show you some of the lines and the, and the retrieves that we use to make this fly very effective. The nice thing about the Psycho Quad that I found when you're tying it is all the different ingredients you put in. The soft hackle, the nice fluffy tail, the marabou tail. You know, it's got all the ingredients that incorporates everything, all the good materials into one fly. And how do you fish? Yeah, I use... Uh different lines here I've got you can use a clear intermediate if you want you don't have to have all the lines the clear intermediate is one of my most popular lake lines here's one of my uh, a line from a friend of mine Jim Teeny the clear clear sink tip and we start fishing these these flies at a, at a 30 degree angle uh, Rickards has really got, got me on this a few years ago and he found it in real tough conditions and we started fishing these nymphs up at 30 degree angles where we felt these small insects like mayflies and so forth are, don't hatch straight up like a okay. chronomid. And they don't swim horizontal either, like, uh, so we, we don't want a horizontal presentation. We want this, this angle that you can see with my fly line right now. That's where I'll start retrieving my, my fly, is when I'll start working it. You see the angle yeah. of my line is in the water now. So yeah, again, people are gonna have to figure out what a 30 degree angle is to the water. Well, so looking at the water level like here. It's 30 degree from the flat. Right, you're looking at an angle from the water about 30 degrees. Yes. And that, it, it seems to work. It does, yes. That, uh, there's times of the year when the uh, when the mayflies and that are going, or any of your bugs are hatching, and then the, then those fish are looking for nymphs and and uh, very good presentation for a nymph. Okay. The hopper is not your traditional lake pattern. It's mainly fished in rivers, but here in Alberta, where we have a lot of grasslands surrounding the lakes. You get a lot of hoppers that are blowing into the water or hopping in the water on their own. So the next fly Brent is going to tie is called Brent's Hopper. Make sure you have these materials ready before you tie the fly. For the hook, we're going to use a 3X long dry fly, size 6 to 8. We'll tie with some 6 aught dun thread along with some clear mono. For the body, we use some yellow fly foam, some deer hair for the head, some barred rubber legs for the legs, and for the wing, we'll use some turkey quill. As Don said about hopper fishing in our part of the country is very, very exciting. I really look forward to it every year. We get all these big fish looking up top for hoppers as they get blown into the water. I'm going to tie my foam on a little differently than some do. I'll just penetrate the uh, foam here with a hook point. Just get it in. Now we're going to tie from the bottom up. I'm going to use some mono, clear mono thread. You won't see that form the body. You'll just see the segmentation is what I want. So we'll just take a little extra time. Now generally people tie foam from the top down and the hook is exposed on the bottom. Now these fish are looking at the fly from the bottom, so I'm really more concerned about how the fish see it than, than, the, than myself as an angler. Now we're gonna have the hook shank on the top here. I'll take my thread back by the barb two or three turns, now I've got it tied in. A little butt at the end there. So when we go here now, I'll go up to the hook shank, take a couple turns again to my next segment, go around, and it'll look like an individual segment. Then I'll come back through the top, take a few more turns, if you can see that there. I'm just wrapping on the shank, and I'll take a few more turns. That way I'm not looking like I'm Xing the foam on, it's actual individual segments. So I'm wrapping just the shank and segment the body. You see here there's no split on the bottom. It's on the top and it's almost closed up too so that uh, fly looks very good. So I'm going to take some turkey quill for the for the wing, fold it, cut it at an angle, lay it over to just about the tail there, the end of the butt of the 
hopper. There's a model appearance. Now basically the uh, monofilament, I'm done with that. I'm going to tie that off, make sure that's good tight and solid. Make sure you get lots of good wraps and your flies are staying together for you. You don't want them falling apart. Don't spend a little extra time wrapping on your flies when you have time building these flies. Now next step, there's a lot of deer hair uh, heads you can use. I'm going to try to select myself a little patch of deer hair that's got some short tips on it. I'm just going to use a little bullet head, clear the under fur out so it'll stack, drop it in my hair stacker, tips first. Now here I'm going to pull it out, I'm going to trim these butts off very even. There's a little tip that uh, I've seen on Rainy's float foam video years ago on how to tie bullet heads. You just lay it in at the side, grab it from the side just so it's got a little bit of those butts attached. Make sure you got a couple turns on there. Now it should spin right around and secure the bullet head in. The butts are not going to be sticking through the, the bullet head once you pull it back. There we go. Now a little bullet head tool, you can use your fingers if you want, but these bullet head tools are very inexpensive. Just a piece of rubber here with a hole in it basically. You can get them there in three sizes in a package. I'm going to go back, push that over to my tie off position. Okay, with my tan or rusty dun thread or whatever, just to match the color of the deer hair. Now there, that will add to the floatability as well. Now I don't want the deer hair poking down in the water. We're just going to trim that a little bit flat. I'll just take a pair of these barred rubber legs here. I tie it always in pairs. They're always the same. Take a couple soft turns. Now I'll take a pair of the outside and this side and I just pull them across and they'll be ready to go. And I can tie that off. A couple light turns there. We're good. And all we have to do now is trim you can pull these, if they slip down on you, you can just pull them, you can manipulate them a little bit. After you get into a tying rhythm, you'll, you'll understand, or you can also cut them in sections before you start. Hoppers are a huge food item for big trout, and uh, an excellent source of food when there's a little bit of a breeze, these, these fish will be tight on the banks, and it's probably the most exciting fishing that I've ever done, is hopper fishing in the fall, so let's get out on the water and show you how to fish it. Obviously it's not hopper season, it's kind of mid to late May and obviously hopper season is around August, but we still wanted to show you the techniques that, uh, that we'll use when we're hopper fishing. So I think what we'll do, Don, is if you don't mind, I'll show you uh, the people how to fish a hopper pattern. Sure. Uh, there's not a lot of finesse to it really, we want to make sure we, we plop our hopper onto the water, kind of wake the fish up if you will. Yeah. So I cast, I really want to point my my rod tip low when I deliver my hopper. I just smack it down in the water, wake the fish up. So that's the delivery. When I get it there, I'm just gonna flick my rod tip up a little bit every once in a while, just give a nice little twitch. You see, I can see my hopper down there just wiggling a little bit. Well, the next pattern we're actually gonna take you to is a big dragon. Brent ties up a real nice dragonfly that it's what he calls a neutral buoyant fly. <laughs> Dragonfly nymph patterns are a tough pattern to fish and a lot of people don't fish them mainly because you have to be down in the zone where they hang out and that's in the weeds. It's very frustrating always pulling weeds off your fly. But Brent's come up with a really good pattern that he calls Brent's Dragon and it's a neutral buoyancy fly. It stays in the zone and doesn't get weeded up as bad. Make sure you have these materials ready before you tie the fly. For the hook we're going to use a salmon dry fly size 6 to 8. We'll tie with 6 aught olive thread some black mono eyes for the eyes. For the body, we'll use some olive furry foam, some pheasant rump for the legs, and for the wing case, we'll use some turkey quill. Hey folks, the next fly we're doing, as Don mentioned, is a dragonfly pattern of mine. It's a neutral buoyant fly that doesn't uh, get hung up in the bottom a lot. It doesn't float above the weeds like some of the clipped deer hair flies do, or heavily weighted flies are always snagging up down the bottom, so that seems to create difficulty for us as anglers. 
I'm going to just X some monofilament eyes on there. I don't use bead chain eyes because I want to keep the weight down. I spend a lot of time tying these flies and going back and forth to the bathtub full of water and seeing which flies would actually be neutral buoyant. So I'll just get some scissors and cut a strip off my furry foam patch here and tie that on the back. We can lash that down nice and tight. It's foam, of course, so we can shape that a little bit as, as we spin it forward. Now the body, we're just going to start a little bit narrow at the back and we build a bit of a hump and then we get a little bit narrow again. The shape on these dragons, of course, their darners or compass or whatever will change. As you know, colors will change from olives to tans, browns, and that type of thing. So you can match match colors to your conditions. These little rump feathers, I just attach one on either side. They make a nice little leg. There we go. What I'm going to do is just get my uh, turkey quill here. We'll use that for the wing case. Um, that we don't need uh, too wide a segment of that. I'm just going to tie it right. With the eye here, with the dull side, the poor side up. Now my seal for, I forgot this on the list of materials, but I will put a little seal on here. I just need to fill in my, uh, the head of the fly, so I need a little dubbing, so of course the seal is good as soon as I get it to bite here. There we go. And I don't want too much on there. I'm just going to basically fill the thorax of the bug, X through the, the eyes a little bit. Fill that up. And then pull the turkey quill segment over for the wing case. You'll get a little bit of a natural fold there. And uh, quite an easy fly to tie. It's not super difficult. A few steps to it, but. Make sure all my legs and that look good. A little bit of seal, I like to eat that. I can trim if there's any little wild hairs sticking out. But a nice little bug and like I said, the neutral buoyancy where I can just lay it on the bottom of the lake is, it really works well for me. And uh, we'll get out in the water and show you folks how to fish this fly. <laughs> A great pattern you know I really enjoy watching different kind of patterns tied and that's a special pattern now I think we ought to search down and, and see how we're gonna fish it how do you like to fish those dragons well like I say I tie a neutral buoyant fly so what uh, stays I can fish it right on the bottom of the lake of course where the dragon nymphs are the uh, a lot of patterns are tied heavily weighted so they can get them down to floating lines or what have you but uh, the fish don't like to pick them up the, uh, they'll drop a lot of those those flies on you the uh, neutral buoyancy, I can, I can fish right down in the depths where it belongs, but it doesn't stir up all the junk on the bottom of the lake and get hung up. Well, I think you made a really good point, you know, about the neutral buoyancy. We're looking at a ledge along here, and it is a nice shoal ledge. It's just about a foot, two feet, and it drops off a little bit. Great place to fish dragons. Right. And what Brent is saying about neutral buoyancy, the, really the fly doesn't sink, and it doesn't float. It just stays neutral in the water level. And I know you've got a full sink on. Yeah, so I'll use, depends on the depth of the lake, Don, but generally a type 3 or a type 6 full sink, and I'll lay my line right on the bottom of the lake and have, uh, you know, three feet of fluorocarbon on uh, the head of my fly and, and uh, just hand twist that dragon really, really slow and imitate the uh, dragon nymph crawling up to the shoreline. So now we want to talk a little bit about the retrieve of the dragon. Uh, what are you doing? What's special? Well, basically, like I say, Don, we have used a type 3 to a type 6 uh, full sink line to get it, the line to lay in the bottom of the lake. Okay, and that, what, any count or do There's you only about? one zone, really, that a dragon nymph lives, and that's okay. on the bottom. On the bottom. So that's, we want to make sure our fly line's on the bottom. I feel comfortable. I know that uh, previous experiences, we were probably fishing about five feet of water out there is all. So uh, my line, knowing I'm confident it's on the bottom, I'll just start a very slow Hand, hand retrieve, hand twist, brutally slow. The next pattern we're going to tie you is a generic shrimp pattern. And then what is it called? Just a... Just a freshwater shrimp pattern, Don. And I've, you know, really, uh, they're hard to come up with anything new there. I just tie one with a little orange in the center, you know, to represent the uh, pregnant 
females, the the fish kind of key in on them a little higher in protein, we're told. But um, a lot of lakes, you know, that sh shrimp are main food source in a lot of lakes. They are. Well, let's go to the, the bench and tie you up a shrimp pattern. <laughs> Brent's got a real nice pattern for you coming up next and it's called Brent's Shrimp. Make sure you have these materials ready before you tie the fly. For the hook we're going to use a curved scud size 12 to 14. We'll tie with 6 aught fire orange thread. For the body we we'll use some light olive ice dub with olive and orange seal fur. Some light olive scud back for the shell back. Some copper wire for the ribbing. And some pale olive saddle for the tail and hackle. Okay folks, now what we'll do is we're going to tie a little shrimp pattern and you can go to a scud hook or this is a kind of a keel balance hook is what it's called. It's got a very wide deep on it and uh, I'm just going to dress my fly hook all the way down around the bend here. Get a little bit of a curve, curve to it. Now I'll grab some nice uh, pale olive or light colored uh, grizzly hackle here. We're just going to pinch a little bit off here for a tail very short. Make sure that ties around the bend. There we go. Trim our butts that off. Grab some of the uh, scud back. Tie that in at the top. And some of our copper wire for the ribbing. This here uh, dubbing what I've done is blended up some ice dub, some light olive, uh, UV ice dub if you wish. Uh, really nice material and I put it, uh, blended in some light olive seal fur with that just to kind of take a little bit of the, the shine out of the uh, ice dub not to overdo it. So there we're gonna, just going to do our body there. When we get to the center here what we want is just a little of that orange to imitate the pregnant shrimp. So I'm just going to Dub in just a little enough here to give it a little coloration right in the center. There we go. Trim off any little wild ones there. Throw another half hitch in to make sure I, I don't mix it. Then we'll go here with our front. We'll just put our olive in the front there. Quite a simple fly and to fish and also to tie. Take my scud back over the top. I can manipulate that around a little bit when I put my wire on here. And I'm just going to give that some segmentation over the top. And tie it off the eye, of course. I'm crowding the eye here, so I'm just going to pull it back with the thumbnail and then tie my materials back. Keep that eye clean because you, you don't want to be putting cement in there or, or unable to get your tippet through when you're on the water. Make sure those eyes are clean and uh, so forth. So here it's, we're not getting a lot of buggy nature out of the bottom and I want to pick that out a little bit. Just get a bodkin and take a little time here to grab some of that dubbing. And I'll just get a little bit of dubbing exposed on the bottom and it looks more like very natural like the shrimp. You can run hackle through it if you want. It's hard to get hackle really that small and uh, this little bit of dubbing just peck, poked out of the bottom just pretty much does the trick. Very simple to tie and also to fish so we'll go in the water and uh, we'll give this fly a shot in the weeds. <laughs> The shrimp pattern we just showed you is pretty well a generic shrimp pattern for freshwater shrimp. I mean, a lot of times the way I tie them, again, same way you did. You know, we'll try to imitate that, the egg sac of the pregnant shrimp or the parasite that's in the back of the shrimp, that orange color, and it really adds to the pattern. Yeah, it sure does, Don. Uh, when we're fishing the uh, shrimp pattern, too, we'll want to try to, shrimp are living right in the weed beds, of course, that, and the trout know that, and they're going to be in there shaking them loose. And uh, trout put a lot of pounds on eating shrimp, and uh, we want to make sure we, we keep our fly in there a long time. So uh, a good line choice would be either a clear, clear intermediate or even those nice, uh, like a clear tip. You can clear get tips, as well. They're right. very, very nice. 
you basically you don't have to retrieve it all the way back if you fish the the shore zone if you're if you maybe retrieve it 10 or 15 feet back and then pitch it back in there that's really the zone isn't it yeah Where it is for sure it. and that's the most important thing when you're fishing shrimp you have to be in the zone you have to be in the weeds because that's where the shrimp are and the nice thing about shrimp is you can fish them year round like that is the staple of most fish and they will eat them all through winter all through spring summer and fall yes so it is a great go-to pattern job with the net there. I sure <laughs> yes. like you to come and visit me. I, yeah. I get to do some fishing. <laughs> well, the next pattern we're actually going to go to is one of my favorites, obviously. I love to fish chronomids. And, you know, I'm used to fishing tiny little chronomids, like size 20s, 18s, 16s. I know you over here get the uh, advantage of fishing big, big flies. Yeah, we can fish some blood worms on the bottom, you know, fairly steady through the year. But now uh, we're just going to start getting into the bomber hatch. And these, these chronomids are over an inch long. Oh, and uh, awesome when the, these, these trout know to go with the feeding really heavy on them. And, and they will get selective on bombers. So. Nice. Well, let's go to the bench and we're going to tie you up Brent's bomber. Chronomids are one of my favorite patterns to fish. And the nice thing about the Pacific Northwest is we got plenty of big chronomids. I'm talking an inch and a half long, and we call them bombers. So the next pattern Brent's going to tie is Brent's bomber. So make sure you have these materials ready before you tie the fly. For the hook, we're going to use a curved dry fly, size 8 to 10. We'll tie with 6 aught black thread. We'll use some .01 lead for the weight, some black stretch floss for the body, some clear stretch magic for the overbody. For the thorax, we'll use some peacock hurl, some pheasant tail for the wing case, and for the gills, we'll use some white ostrich hurl. Next fly I'll tie for you folks is a bomber pattern, which they do get very large size. I just led the probably the front half or so of the hook with the one old lead. Just going to do a little overbody with the just put a little thread and dress my hook over here. We'll put our materials on and I'm going to take some stretch magic. It's just a little material I found really in a craft shop one time and it's very, very stretchy and clear and it gives us kind of that gas bubble appearance that these chronomids do have over their abdomen. So we're going to try that. We use that on a lot of our smaller midge patterns as well. And, and we'll use some uh, stretch flex here or you can use just floss, whatever you like for the body, but we want to kind of taper it. From thin to th a little bit thicker in the front. So I take my thread to the thread post and I'll start working my stretch floss forward. Try to taper my body. As you see, if we get to the, to the lead here, it starts tapering off fairly nicely. I'm getting some segmentation there, as midge patterns all do have. Make sure that's tied off nice and secure. Another half inch on there. Then we're going to go forward with the, the stretch magic, the clear stretch magic, and you can see this stuff is very, very elastic. So I'm going to pull it down a little bit tighter at the back. And as I start going forward, and I can leave a little segmentation on. I'm going to start like, taking the pressure off it now. It's a little thicker. I get the taper I'm looking for, and also that transparent appearance of the midge then they hold that gas in their abdomen they come to the surface. So we'll just take a little bit of uh, peacock curl here for the for a wing case. Works great for that. We'll grab some of our peacock curl. All we need about uh, two or three strands here should be plenty. Tie that in by the Tips, tips again, like I do in all my flies, like tie the peacock curl by the tips. I can wind it forward, but I'm just going to build that rope again. It's just going to be a little more durable, so the durability is always key for my flies. I like, like to have them strong. Catch more fish on the same fly, the better off we keep fishing instead of changing. We'll take our, our 
white peacock or ostrich frill, I should say, over the front here for the gills. About three or four turns in the front there, got a nice set of white gills on it. Trim it off, make sure we clean our eye out here so we're not going to glue anything in there that we don't want. And then just take our pheasants over the top, get her bound in. Black thread on there again as we know what it's weighted. You could put beads on this if you wish, but this gives it a pretty natural appearance. You take samples, throat samples of these fish, it uh, matches them pretty good. And, and uh, you can fish these flies in the zone when these big bombers are coming off. Fish really get pretty selective on them, and, and uh, I sure like that stretch magic over the top. I know a lot of you guys have fish midges or might want to check that out. And another one of your neat fly tying materials. So let's get on the water and uh, give this bomber a, a go. <music> How do you like to fish Chronimus? Well, I usually fish them under uh, an indicator as well. Um, over in Alberta here, we're allowed to use three flies, so I'll fish a team of... Three flies? Yeah, so I'll fish three. a team of, uh, you know, the lead fly, the mid fly, and the point fly. Uh, generally, you can put on the bottom of the point fly, you can put a, like a blood uh, midget or something down there would be really good, or if the uh, bomber hatch is going, uh, which we do get here uh, early spring, uh, that I may even put on the bottom too. Uh, another thing with a three fly rig, I'll, I'll just show it to you really quickly, is I use a, a mustad snap hook. It gives oh, okay. my flies a lot more movement. And uh, also if you're searching, you can put on three different colors maybe too. So oh, you'll okay. kind of see, uh, let, let the fish tell you which ones they're eating. Cover the whole range. Yes. So we have a little snap hook. So when these, when this line is really, if I get you to hold my rod sure. just a second here, Don. I'm going to use my little snap hook, so it really doesn't matter what angle I'm running at, they always hang straight oh, down. Okay. And they're always wiggling. As you know, the, the chronomids or midges always have to wiggle. My point fly, I could use a snap hook on that as well, or just use a Duncan loop knot, of course. So movement's really the key again, you want that little wriggly motion. <laughs> fish on the chronomid. Oh man, you know what? I want to thank you very much for doing the video. You know, you can't beat it. You get some, some people together. We always have a good time when we come on fishing. And we were able to do, like Brent said, the video, all the flies and everything in one day, which is just amazing. Yeah, it's great fun. We, uh, I always enjoy having you and Grant come out and visit us and fish with me and, and uh, tie some flies and catch some fish. Nothing but you a know, good time. It's, it's, all, it's all about fun, isn't it, and who you're with. Yeah, so, totally. you know, it's really nice. Make sure you always take a kid fishing, something to always remember their entire life. Absolutely. Pass it on. Yeah, pass it on, exactly. Yeah. Right. Fantastic. Well, thanks a lot again. Thanks. Nice fish. Yeah, beautiful. Oh. <laughs> 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 right in the face. Right in the face. For the bench segments, Brad will be doing all the time, and I'll be introducing the materials. <laughs> introducing the materials. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a long. Oh, yeah, here we go. Well, we've made it to the bench, and Brent will be doing all the time, and I'll be introducing the materials we'll meet in saying. Well, the next pattern we're going to tie. The next pattern we're going to tie. Oh. Stick. I know. Tie your ankle. The choke kind of yeah. key in on them. And I know Grant is going to have, uh, he's going to key on and look what. Oh, oh I don't want to break your net. <laughs> $200 net. <laughs> Oops.
The next pattern we're going to tie you is just a generic shimp. Shimp. <laughs> 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 okay. The next pattern we're going to tie you is a generic shrimp. <laughs> I got to my head. I got to say shrimp. 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 so many different food items. Make sure you have these materials ready before you tie the fly. The fly. The fly. Corona with... Corona <laughs> read. Corona read. Corona read. Okay. Needed. The first fly we're going to tie is Brent seal bugger. No, it's not. Frick, it's Danny Seal Bugger. Okay. Sweet, sweet Granny, I gotta freaking nod in there. He's all done bunged up. <laughs>